Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. And we have up for you right now a survey that a number of you have already answered. So I want to give those who are just joining a few more seconds to answer that. Um, but I'll go ahead and introduce our webinar and our presenter for the day. We have today tort liability and risk management for local public agencies. And our presenter is Ron Eck from the West Virginia LTAP Center. He is their director and he has a long tenure in the civil engineering area, including being a witness at trials for um, different organizations, I guess you would say agencies with the tort liability topic. And I think you'll find that the ex expertise that Ron brings this topic with the engineering perspective is going to be an excellent addition to your knowledge. So we're glad to have you here. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask of those of you who are on, if you would please fill in the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. And while you do that, I'm going to go ahead and close this survey out. And I'm going to share the results just so everybody knows who we've got on here. We've got state agencies represented at 37% local government agencies at 46, 14% 14 from the private sector, three from educational or training, and one from our federal partners. So welcome to all of you. In that question box, what I'd like to do is ask you to please drop me a higher hello. Looks like a number of you have been on here before with us and have done that. The reason I'm asking you to do that is that periodically throughout the presentation, Ron will be stopping to ask for any questions you've put in that box. And I want to make sure that if you have questions that you're able to get them in there. So that way I can read them off for a response. Um, this is a four part webinar. We have today, Thursday, next Tuesday and the following Thursday. If you attend all four parts, um, you will get a separate um, recognition from us where you get credit for the entire course. Um, on a daily basis though, we will be giving out certificates of completion for the 1.5 hours for your continuing professional development credits. So if you can't make all four, that's okay. You'll still get the CPDs for the sessions you have made. But if you want full credit, say you're working towards your Road Scholar level one, two or three in Ohio or Road Scholar in another state that has said they will count this, you will need to be on for all four sessions. So I think that's all I had, Ron. Are you ready? I'm ready. Thanks. Thank you, Victoria. Welcome, everyone. I guess I should say good morning and good afternoon. I, we have some folks from the West Coast with us, so we're pleased to see you. I also noted a few of my West Virginia friends and colleagues, so welcome as well. It's good to be among friends here for this presentation. Uh, as Victoria said, this is tort liability and risk management. This week, the two days this week, we'll focus probably more on the tort aspect, and then next week, the risk management. As she indicated, uh, I'm a civil engineer. I spent uh, most of my career at West Virginia University on the faculty teaching various transportation classes, including traffic engineering, highway engineering, pedestrian bicycles, roadway design, highway safety, uh, plus a number of other courses. I was also director of the LTAP uh, program in West Virginia, probably the last 15 years. Then about 12 years or so ago, I retired from the university. I love LTAP, so I'm still involved in LTAP. I do training, public works related training uh, around the country, or at least I did when we could do in-person training before COVID. But this some, spring and summer, I've been involved doing uh, this online training. I probably should mention too that throughout my career, probably for 40 years, sort of on the side, I did uh, some forensic engineering work, testified as an expert witness, and uh, so picked up experience. And that's where I really got the idea for this class. I thought it would be nice to sort of link the experiences from the, the legal side to the folks in the field or the folks actually designing and building and maintaining and operating roadways to see what sort of lessons we could transfer to maybe try to reduce risk or manage risk. And I should also add, probably from the 1990s into the early 2000s, the LTAP centers in the mid-Atlantic region 
would host what was called a roadway management conference. It was a three-day conference that obviously dealt with issues regarding roadways. But one of the features of that conference every year was one afternoon we would have a mock trial of some roadway-related uh, lawsuit. And in some cases, we were actually fortunate enough to have the actual attorneys that you know, were involved in the original trial or in the original case. And it, if you ever get a chance to participate or observe a mock trial, I'd encourage you to do so because it's a great way to learn about the process. And it's, it's interesting and obviously a serious matter, but in some ways it's almost a fun sort of exercise to observe this uh, concise recreation of the actual courtroom situation. And through that, I got to meet attorneys throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, and everyone was kind enough to share their knowledge and information. And so in a few of the case studies we'll look at next week, I actually have the trial exhibits and so forth that the parties did present or were going to present at trial in the cases. So I thought that would be good to give you a flavor for some of the strategies and the tactics that the attorneys use. You also have my email address there. After the class, if questions or concerns come up, feel free to, to shoot me an email. I'll be glad to try to respond. Okay, there we go. My screen froze for a second. Before we start, I'd like to give you an agenda of what we'll talk about over the next week or so, week plus. Uh, today, we'll talk about tort liability, what it is, what it isn't, a few legal terms associated with it. Then on Thursday, we'll look at the tort claims process, what I call personal matters, meaning what if you might be named in a lawsuit individually. Uh, also, then we'll look at some common problem areas such as design or work zones, maintenance, those kinds of things. Day three, we'll talk about risk management, including some risk management tips. And this will be approached from the standpoint of for organizations, risk management for organizations, but also for you personally or individually. And then we'll also, if time permits, we'll get in, start getting into the case studies. I have a number of case studies of actual lawsuits that were filed against road agencies around the country. And we'll look at these from the standpoint of what lessons can we learn from these lawsuits to kind of reduce our risk exposure or to help manage that risk. And then day four, we'll devote entirely to those uh, case studies and we'll see, I have a number of them. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. So that's an overview of what we'll talk about. My objectives are pretty straightforward. I mean, I hope by the end of the session, you'll understand the importance of and the implications of port liability risk for road agencies or public works agencies. That's going to be our focus. We will review some legal aspects. I'll introduce some legal terms. I'll try to keep those to a minimum and I'll apologize up front because there will be a number of them, but I do feel it's necessary to understand those both. So if you run into those terms in your work, you'll be able to understand what they mean, but also to give you a feel for the overall uh, process and, and issues involved. And as I indicated, we'll look at some ways to reduce risk both for your organization and for you personally. Sorry, my screen keeps hanging up. And actually, before we get to this one, Victoria, could we maybe do the uh, the poll, poll, the remaining polling questions now? You've got it. Let me go ahead and put the next one up here. Okay, if you can't answer this question on your screen for some reason, you keep clicking and it won't take the answer. It's probably because you're in full screen mode. Just hit the escape key and that'll help you be able to answer. We are not recording how you answer any of these poll questions, so don't worry about that. Just go ahead and pick a choice. Now, so talking I, about your work life, not your personal life. That's none of my <laughs> business, but in your work life, and it could be for your current employer or a previous employer, but 
something in the public works realm or roadway area? Have you given a deposition? Yeah, we're up to like 90% 90, 90 that have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close the question out and share the results. We have 28% uh, that said yes and 72% that said no. Okay, so good. I'm going to hide that and we'll do the next poll question. Now we have a related question, but now have you testified at trial on behalf of an employer in, in the roadway public works area? And that's as broad as you want to make it. Last time I thought this, someone asked, I've testified in a right of way case. Does that count? I would say yes. It doesn't have to be a, a car crash or something like that. Anything to do with kind of public works and the work that we do. We're up over 80% voted, so I'm going to go ahead and close this one out and then share the results. We have 17% yes and 83% no. Okay, that's, inter that's higher than normally when I teach it in person, so that's good. Yep. Now I'll launch the last one. I have to mention while this question's up there that I actually got called for jury duty two months ago. But luckily, I didn't have to go at the last minute when I called in because I was kind of worried about how they were going to socially distance us all. Yeah, so they're still having trials. That's interesting. My county, they are. Wow. So. Yeah, when the trial I'm asking about, this could be any kind of trial. It could be a criminal trial. It could be white collar crime. It could be a roadway case. But just I just want to see who, who has the the experience of actually sitting through or participating in a trial kind of from start to finish. We're over 80% having voted, so I'm going to close this one down and share the results. It's 25% yes and 75% no. Okay, good. All right, and that I believe are all of our poll questions. Okay, thank you, Victoria. That's good. So some of you obviously have experience, uh, even though those of you that may not have been on a jury in jury duty, probably from books and TV and films, you have a feel for the process. And we'll talk a little bit about that probably next time. And also for, I'm surprised so many have given depositions, but we will talk uh, next time about some tips for testifying, for giving, giving depositions. So those of you that haven't, maybe at some point in your public works career, you may have to do that, so hopefully we'll we'll give some tips to try to make it a little bit of less less apprehensive or intimidating experience. But let's go on, and before we get into things, a few caveats from me. Uh, I mentioned I'm an attorney, I'm not an engineer, so what I'm presenting over the next oh, few days. Hold on, Ron, you did that backwards. You said you're an attorney and not an engineer. Oh, sorry, sorry. thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay, I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, that's what I would have said. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, I'm an engineer, not an attorney. Uh, but I have worked with attorneys for a number of years, and so I've tried to, to learn from them or pick up some things, and I'll try to share those with you. But those, that's really just Ron's sort of engineering take or thoughts on things. It's not, not legal advice. Also, we have a group from across the country today, so I'll be speaking in generalities. Obviously, the laws differ from state to state. Each of us has, each of our states have different laws in terms of the types and nature of suits that can be filed against public agencies or, or against private agencies. But also, even in a particular state, two cases may look very similar, but if you dig down into them, really, they're usually not. There's different fact scenarios. The, the judge may give different instructions to the jury uh, and those sorts of things. So I'm going to share with you generalities, but just keep in mind that specific cases, uh, of course, do differ from state to state, location to location. One thing I wanted to mention, too, as the third bullet there indicates, is that I think in this country, the media tend to focus on unusual verdicts. Uh, and there was a case, was it 10 or 12 years ago? Maybe some of you are more familiar with it than I am. I think it was in the 
Houston, Texas area involving a McDonald's drive through I think a jury awarded a woman maybe over a million dollars for burns that she sustained from the coffee that she picked up at the McDonald's drive through You know, I've had people tell me, wow, don't, don't you know that when you get fresh coffee like that, it's probably going to be hot? You know, how could something like that, how could a verdict like that come about? And I don't know all the facts of the case, but uh, my experience has kind of been the opposite. I think I've testified in about 20 states or so in roadway related cases. And my experience has sort of been the reverse. I think if a public agency does a good job of educating the jury about what we do and how we do it and the constraints that we operate under, I think more often than not, the jury will render a verdict in favor of the road agency. At least that's been my experience. And if you think about it, it probably makes sense. Jurors, for the most part, are taxpayers like us. They tend to be, they want to be conservative with the public money. And so they're not going to just uh, automatically award or make a big award to a plaintiff unless it's justified. But of course, the fact that there may be many, many defense verdicts, that's probably not exciting news. That doesn't sell advertising or newspapers or TV time or that sort of thing. But to me, that is the good news. So we shouldn't be misled by the media reporting on these unusual verdicts and think that that's something we have to you know, be afraid of or worried about because that's, to me, that's the exception more so than the rule. But one thing we do need to be aware of is that sympathy can play a very large role in these cases. Uh, those of you that have been in, on jury duty or in a trial, I don't know if it was a personal injury case, but if it was, maybe as part of the instructions to the jury, the judge may have said you are not to let sympathy enter into your decision. And that's, that's a correct instruction. But if you think about it, say, especially if you have maybe a young person, maybe a teenager, maybe, maybe the teenager was even a high school athlete or very active. And now as a result of a crash, maybe they're in a wheelchair and they'll be in a wheelchair the rest of their life. Uh, and maybe the trial goes for one week. And so every day as the jurors are seated in the jury box, they may see this person being wheeled in and out of the courtroom in the morning and during breaks and lunch and in the afternoon. And, and maybe that person needs other assistance as well. And so it's just human nature that there is going to be some feelings of sympathy for that person. And that does may come to light in the uh, jury verdict. So we need to keep that in mind. And that may explain why sometimes public agency attorneys may settle a case when if we look at it, we may think, wow, why did we do that? In fact, I was thinking, I guess the last live class I taught back in March was, was this particular class, or I should say in-person class I taught was this class. And I remember during the first break, someone came up to me from a local road agency and he was describing how my agency just settled the case for a quarter million dollars but we didn't do anything wrong. We should have had our day in court so we could have proven to the jury that we didn't do anything wrong. And then he proceeded to describe a little bit about the case. And it seemed to me from what he described that, that this was a case that had a high sympathy factor and probably the attorneys felt it was best to settle the case rather than risk a big verdict at trial. Because I think if you talk to both plaintiff's attorneys or to the defense attorneys that represent public agencies, they'll both tell you that once you get into the courtroom, it's kind of like rolling the dice, really anything can happen, no matter how strong a case you feel you have, once you get in the courtroom, anything can happen. So we need to keep that in mind too, maybe, in as we go through this material over the next few days. I do have a exercise to get us started here. I think it was sent out earlier, but if you haven't had a chance to read it, we might give a minute or so now for you to read or reread that icebreaker exercise handout. Just a paragraph or so. It shouldn't take very long. Yeah, and if they didn't receive the email, Ron, I uh, did load that into the handout 
pod of the GoToWebinar panel. Then That's you can right. download it from there. That's right. Thanks, Victoria. No problem. Okay, well, let's. I have some questions or a question for you then after reading that. Who do you think would have a lawsuit filed against them? A is Joe's dad, B the city, C the school district, D the property owner, E the state DOT, whose road it was, F the source of the alcohol, or any other parties. You can put your entries into the uh, question box. We're getting a few comments. Everybody's saying all of the above, everybody, everyone. I want to add my personal in answer to it too. I want to say the deep pockets. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's yeah, thanks for introducing that term, Victoria. Many of you have probably heard that term, right? Deep pocket. Yep. And I, I think those of you that responded all of the above or all of the entities there, I would agree with that. If you think about it, the operator of the vehicle was Joe. And no disrespect for Joe, but Joe is, is sort of just a kid. He doesn't really have any resources. He may have a part-time job, perhaps. Perhaps he doesn't. He's still in school. But we would all agree, I think, that Joe is certainly not a deep pocket. So a suit might be filed against the other entities involved. For example, Joe's dad. Joe's dad probably would argue, I'm not a deep pocket. I just work for the city. I'm not a deep pocket. But certainly he would probably be a defendant. The city, of course, would because it was their vehicle. The school district, and this would be more of a failure to supervise kind of case rather than sort of a roadway or vehicle case. But certainly, since the alcohol consumption apparently occurred on the school grounds or school property, it is fair to say that the school district would be named as a defendant. The property owner, because I believe I said the tree was on private property, at least the trunk of the tree, and so the property owner would be named as a defendant. The road was a state DOT roadway, so they would certainly be named as a defendant. And I didn't give you much information about it, but would we agree that there had to be an adult somehow involved in getting the alcohol to the, the young people, whether it was the sales clerk who didn't card them when the, at the store or some other adult who provided it to them or whatever. But I think the source of the alcohol would probably also be named as a defendant. Did we have any others that people may have typed in as other, Victoria? You know, I, a lot of people, they didn't really comment on the other part of it. Um, they just gave different variations of who it was that you had listed on there. Okay. Like they may not have chose everybody. They, one person said A, B, D, E. Okay. One other one that might be uh, brought in, and this would be, this is getting to the, maybe the trick question part of things here, but it could very well happen, is that one or more of these defendants that are identified on the slide might file a countersuit against Sally on the basis that she was aware of Joe's drinking, and yet she got into the vehicle with him. And the argument would be that that was, quote, negligent to do that, that she could have called mom and dad and gotten a ride home or had another couple drive her home or called the Uber or a taxi or something. Uh, so there might very well be a countersuit or more than one countersuit filed against Sally for getting into the vehicle with a young driver who might be impaired. But I think you can see sort of the bottom line is anyone who was involved here or kind of had a hand in this whole chain of events that I outlined for you is a potential defendant. And along the way, some of these might resolve through settlement or other parties might be dismissed. But at least initially, this is probably a good list of who would get the uh, 
complaint or the petition, as it might be called, filed against them. So we're talking today about tort liability. Uh, what is that? What I think most of us probably have a feel for the definition of liability, but maybe not so much for tort. So what is a tort? Uh, tort is not what someone said uh, last fall, I guess, year ago, I gave a guest lecture on this topic at the university, and I asked, what is a tort? And a wise guy in the back of the room said, a tort's what I had for dessert last night. And I think that tort has an E on it, a sweet dessert, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. The tort that we're talking about is basically, as you see in the first bullet there, it's a civil wrong that results in injury or damage. And what do I mean by civil? Well, as you may be aware, in the in our legal system, there's at least two sort of major branches, I guess, or divisions of the courts. One is the criminal division, and the other is the civil division. So that's why the word civil is there. A tort is not a crime. A tort is in the civil division of our courts or legal system. Also notice a tort is independent of a contract. Many of you probably deal with contractors on a regular basis, and maybe there's disagreements over time to completion or change orders or that sort of thing. And not to minimize those, those are significant and may actually result in lawsuits being filed. But that's a different area of the law, that'd be contract law. A tort is independent of a contract. But it is a violation of a duty owed to the injured party. Now, I don't know if those of you that are with public agencies involved in roads and streets, I don't know if you've thought about that, but what is our duty to, let's say, the traveling public, the motoring public or the walking public or the bicycling public? What is the duty? But before we get into that, I did want to give an example of a tort claim. And here we see a two-lane rural road. This is in Appalachia here in the east. It's in coal country. Let me get my pointer here. Uh, and beyond this curve here in the upper right, maybe two or three miles down the road, well beyond there, is a uh, navigable river. And there's what they call a coal dock where coal trucks dump the coal and it is loaded onto barges and then goes to power plants or steel mills or other uh, customers in the region. And in the very much foreground, here kind of in the lower right, is uh, some distance away, maybe a half mile away, is a coal mine. And what was happening, this coal mine was hauling significant quantities of coal in terms of dozens of trucks per hour from the mine to the coal dock. And of course, the empty trucks would come back. And so the empty trucks were coming in this way direction toward us. One of these trucks, one morning, about probably three months before this photo was taken, was coming around this curve here, which would be a left-hand curve for that truck. And notice, this is a edge of, serious edge of pavement drop-off here. It's almost vertical. I measured that at about 11 inches. The right tires of the truck went off the pavement. In fact, you can see that truck is probably not the only one. It looks like there's a pretty good path worn there off the uh, pavement edge. Got off the edge, of, got off the roadway onto the shoulder. And as he was proceeding toward us, and you all probably have seen this as well, uh, most state highway driver licensing manuals say if a motorist is ever in that position, what they should do is slow down, and then when the drop-off is, is at a minimum, gently steer back onto the roadway. But it seems to be human nature. What most motorists do is, of course, yank the wheel to the left to try to get back on the pavement. And because of the height of the drop-off, initially the vehicle does not go to the left, so the driver steers more. And eventually the steering angle is such that the driver will, or the vehicle will mount the pavement, 
but at that point, the, the vehicle is often out of control. And sadly, that's what happened here. You can see these marks. These are classic with edge of pavement drop-offs. These are called yaw marks curving across the roadway. And what's sad about this is this is a Chevy Blazer. It's hard to tell what it is now, but uh, the Chevy Blazer was coming toward us, driven by a mom and taking her eight-year-old son to school. And sadly, they collided with the, uh, the truck. The mom was killed. Uh, fortunately, the, the eight-year-old boy was not seriously injured, but obviously suffered some serious uh, trauma in the crash, emotional trauma. And so the father, the surviving father and husband of the woman who was fatally injured, filed a number of lawsuits. He filed a lawsuit against the driver of the truck for careless negligent operation of the vehicle. He filed a tort claim against the owner of the trucking company for number one, for hiring some you know, a poor driver as the fellow who was driving here. But also there were, it came to light later through the legal process as the case proceeded that there were some steering and braking issues with the truck. So truck maintenance became an issue as well. This is a state road. So the plaintiff also filed a lawsuit against the state DOT. And I mentioned the coal mine, you can barely see it there behind the truck, but there's some gray buildings in the background there. That is the coal mine. And he also filed a lawsuit against the mining company because this road was under a posted and bonding agreement between the mining company and the state DOT, such that actually the mining company was responsible for the upkeep of the road while they were doing this hauling operation. And so in this case, there were actually four defendants. And as the case proceeded, not to, we'll talk more about this later, not to get bogged down in it, but as the case proceeded, what happened was the, the four defendants started pointing fingers at one another, didn't work together. And so that actually worked to the benefit of the, the plaintiff, if you will, such that just before trial, this case, all parties reached an out of court settlement. But that's an example of a typical tort claim in the roadway field that we might deal with. Notice there was injury and damage. In this case, fatal injury, someone was killed. Uh, another individual was injured and uh, as a result, lawsuits were filed. So I mentioned duty before. What are the duties to those of us in the road, roadway field or in public works? So what are the duties? The primary duty is to provide reasonably safe roads. Now you might say, Ron, that's sort of a nebulous kind of answer. How does that help me do my job? better. That word reasonably is not very clear. And I, I would agree with that. In fact, if you think about it, what's reasonable would really be determined by the jury. And I hope by the end of this class, you'll have a feel for what might be reasonable or what might not be reasonable. And of course, each jury might be different depending on the facts of the case. They might render a different verdict in terms of what's reasonable. But if you allow me to back up here, would we all agree that probably an 11 inch almost vertical drop off on a, this is probably about a 20 foot wide two lane roadway with a lot of truck traffic, that's probably not a reasonably safe road. But notice what that does not say. Notice it doesn't say we have to provide 100% safe roads doesn't say we have to guarantee the safety of the road user. doesn't say we have to ensure the safety of the road user. It just says we have to provide reasonably safe roads. So it recognizes crashes are, go are going to happen. We don't have to guarantee the safety of every user. But now a question might come up. because I know we have folks from all over the country, but from folks in the East like me here in West Virginia or my colleagues in say southeastern Ohio, or western Pennsylvania, western Maryland, 
Uh, in this part of the country, many of our roads never were really designed. They just sort of evolved over time from Native American Indian trails, from animal paths. And then when we got carts and wagons, you know, maybe those roads were widened so that the carts could fit through. And then when we got the internal combustion engine and the old Model T Ford and other vehicles like that, then people started you know, saying, we need to get out of the mud. We need to, can you put down some stone on this road to get us out of the mud? Or of course, as vehicles got better and their speeds got higher, then people wanted hard surface roads, asphalt, and concrete. But if you think about it, a lot of those roads were never designed. So their widths may be uh, substandard compared to modern design standards, like that roadway I just showed you in my little example there. Or there may be curves or grades that are steeper than called for in current roadway design standards. But of course, we don't have the resources to bring all those roads up to modern standards. We struggle nowadays, of course, just to maintain our roads. But that brings us to a secondary duty. If you can't provide a reasonably safe road or say can't provide a road that complies with the current criteria, then there's a duty to warn of existing hazards. And so on the roads that I just mentioned, we might find curve warning signs in advance of the curves. Or here in West Virginia, we have a lot of warning signs to truckers for steep grades or for long grades. Or on that curve, we may put chevrons around the outside of the curve to help drivers navigate the curve. Those are all ways to warn drivers of existing hazards. Or think about temporary traffic control work zones. Conditions often change, right? The lanes may narrow, the lanes may shift, they may be a different surface. Maybe we've milled the asphalt from the pavement, and so temporarily the surface is rougher than normal. So we have practices and criteria for installing work zone traffic control, warning signs and other devices to warn and guide motorists in those work areas. That's another example of complying with this duty of warning of existing hazards. So those are the two duties, provide reasonably safe roads, and if we can't always do that, then warn drivers of the hazards. There is a third duty too that's in there as well, and that's what I would call provide reasonable and continuing supervision so that we can become aware of the condition of the roadway and possible deficiencies. That's not to say we have to you know, be out there 24 seven every day of the year inspecting every road, but it does say we need to have a feel for you know, what's going on with our roads. So for example, maybe after a severe storm, that would be a time that we should go out and inspect our roadways to make sure to see if there was a drainage issue or a fallen tree issue or that sort of thing. So those are the kind of the, the duties of road agencies. And any questions up to this point? Yes, we have one. It says, do, you, do we have to warn drivers or all travelers? Do we have a duty to provide reasonably safe conditions for people on bicycles and people walking? Good question, and the answer is yes. We need to consider all, all users, especially these days. With, there seems to be more, more bicycling and walking around the country. So yes, we need to consider all users. And I just would add too that uh, this is not really out of the ordinary in terms of legal duty. We're talking about sort of the public sector here, but in the private sector, like if, if I'm a, a company that runs a big box store, which is obviously a private entity, I have a similar duty. I, once customers come into my store, or even when they come on my property, I as a, say a commercial entity or a retail entity, I have a duty to provide a reasonably safe parking lot, you know, reasonably safe access for pedestrians to walk from their car into my store. And once they're in the store, I have a duty to provide a reasonably safe store, which is why stores, you know, often, especially in the, say, the produce section, they'll be cleaning things up very frequently because they are exposed to, to lawsuits if somebody slips and falls or trips and falls in their store. So they have a similar sort of duty. 
I just want to take a few minutes to mention another type of claim faced by state and local governments. I realize the title of this class is tort liability, and that's what we'll focus on. But for those of you in the towns and cities and states as well, state DOTs, we need to be aware of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, non-compliance, or what I call inaccessible streets and sidewalks that can lead to ADA claims. And ADA is a civil rights law, so it's not tort law, it's civil rights law, but it is a potential risk exposure, liability exposure of public agencies. So I did wanna mention that and just kind of distinguish the two. So remember tort, a tort claim involves what, I, what I'll call harm, some damage or injury or death to, to someone. There's a loss to person or property. And this is usually, a, as I said, a civil court filing or it might be handled internally within the agency. But an ADA lawsuit is a civil rights lawsuit. The plaintiff is not seeking compensation for their injuries. As the first uh, item there shows, what they want is they want equity in access to public services. So the suit might be, I can't get down the street to the pharmacy because the sidewalk slab is heaved up five inches by that big oak tree. You're not making that you know, service accessible to me because of the inaccessible sidewalk. So I, I just wanted to mention that it's not, those are not torts, it's a civil rights claim, but those can also be significant liability exposures for public agencies. And it's something we need to be attentive to. And I may point that out as we go through a few of the, the case studies. Here's one of the legal terms, standard of care. Standard of care might be thought of as the criteria by which reasonableness is judged. I'll repeat that. Standard of care is, think of it as the criteria by which reasonableness is judged. And there's many different examples of standards of care. Agencies, whether it's a state DOT or a town or a city or a county, you probably have your own agency guidelines or policies or regulations or some agencies call them directives of how to deal with certain situations or how things will be designed or maintained. Those agency guidelines and policies would be a standard of care. So it's important that we follow those policies or if we can't, we'll talk about this next week, if we can't, then we need to be sure we've documented why we can't comply with the guideline or the policy so that there's sort of a paper trail, if you will, if there's ever a lawsuit, we can show why we didn't in that instance comply with the criteria. But also guidelines developed by what I call national and professional organizations can also be standards of care. One that hopefully everybody's familiar with around the country is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. That would be considered as the standard of care for signing and marking roadways open to public travel throughout the United States. And I realize different states may have their own versions of the MUTCD, but the foundational document would be the, the national manual. So the MUTCD is a standard of care when it comes to signing and marking or temporary traffic control, part six of the manual for that matter. Some of you may be involved in roadway design. There, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO, their policy on geometric design of highways and streets, the Green Book, that would be a standard of care when it comes to roadway design. And so you can see there's a number of different examples, both at the local level and at the national level, of standards of care. But it's important that we be familiar with the standards of care used in the work we're doing and that we comply with those. Or as I said, if we can't, we need to document why we are not able to comply. Also directives of a superior agency may, be, may set sort of the standard of care. 
And then notice the last item there, I put a couple asterisks by it. Uh, generally, I do not consider engineering texts or journals to be standards of care. That's why I kind of flagged it there. But the reason it's on my list is that we need to be aware that uh, plaintiff's attorneys, personal injury attorneys and their experts may sometimes try to make something that's in, in an engineering textbook or in a journal article or something like that, make it appear as the standard of care. You recall earlier I used the term, we need to educate the jury. This is part of that process. I think it's important that when the road agency personnel say would take the witness stand in a trial, need to educate the jury and the judge that these engineering textbooks and articles, while they may have interesting information, in most cases, they are probably not a standard of care that agencies follow on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's important to be able to rebut that testimony or the opinions of the, the plaintiff in that regard. The element of time comes into these matters as well, as you might appreciate. So two more legal terms. One is notice, or it's also called actual notice. The other is constructive notice. And let's look at each of these. Notice or actual notice means that the public agency was given specific notification about a defect or deficiency in the roadway system. And this could have been an email or a letter or a phone call where someone called in and said, hey, the, you know, this morning I was driving to work and half of the right northbound lane out on 705 is covered with six inches of water. That would be putting the road agency on notice about what appeared to be, what appeared to be a drainage deficiency based on what I've, I've told you. And that sort of starts a clock running then. And when does that agency respond? And if there is a problem, when do they begin to, to address that problem. But it doesn't always have to be a formal notification to the agency. Notice the last item I have on my list there is an editorial in the newspaper. And maybe it's a column that, that's on the uh, opinion editorial page that talks about a maybe an intersection that the editors of the paper feel is dangerous. Or just as an example, they don't do it anymore, but for probably three or four years, a few years ago, the daily paper here where I am in Morgantown, West Virginia, every Saturday morning, they would publish on the editorial page a fairly large size picture of some road deficiency. Sometimes it was an edge of pavement drop off. Sometimes it was a large pothole. Sometimes it was an isolated ice patch in the winter time. And they'd show that picture, and then underneath would be a caption, something to the effect of, you know, our photographer snapped this picture out on Route 6 last week. What do you think of this pothole, or what do you think of this edge of pavement drop-off? And then it might also say, if you're concerned or have a complaint about this, contact, and then they'd identify the local or state uh, person responsible for that section of road and they put in their email address or their phone number. And we may not think of it that way, but what the newspaper, in fact, the newspaper probably thought they were doing a public service, but also what they were doing was actually putting the road agency on notice. I think the courts would say, you know, road agency, you're supposed to be sort of following the news and the media, be aware of what's happening in the community. So that could also be a form of notice to a public road agency. Or I guess these days, you know, agencies have uh, their Facebook and Twitter or other social media. It's important to monitor that. If somebody is commenting on your Facebook page about a maybe a deficiency or something they noted, that would also be considered notice. So we, it would be important to respond to that or at least investigate the situation. The other type of notice is what's called constructive notice. And this is more strict than just notice. It says after a reasonable period of time, 
even if no one told you about it, a prudent agency should be aware of a roadway defect. And I'm going to come back to this slide, but let me skip ahead here. This is not a good situation. Would we all agree with that? Stop sign, it's, that's a, to me, that's a safety critical sign, right? It allocates right of way. A safety critical sign is face down in the ditch. What if I told you I took this photograph three months after the stop sign was knocked down? Would we all agree that within three months, somebody from that road agency should have been aware that the stop sign was down? I mean, somebody probably maintenance crew should have been passing through that intersection, or even if they weren't, local uh, fire department or police, emergency responders should have been passing through that intersection and should have identified it and reported it. So this would be an example if in my hypothetical here of three months, this would be a case where the plaintiff could claim you knew or you should have known about this stop sign that was knocked down. So that's an example of constructive notice. And it could be, as I say there, a, an edge drop off that exists for a couple years or uh, it, we've all probably seen this somewhere where every winter due to there's probably an underlying drainage problem but every winter there seems to be an isolated ice look spot at a particular location that would be constructive notice that the agency should have known about that and i know we have folks from all over the country here so i should point out most states have constructive notice but there are a few states around the country and again, remember I said the laws vary from state to state. There are a few states that do not have constructive notice. And so in those states, a plaintiff has to prove that the road agency knew about the deficiency. They can't say you should have known. But for the rest of us, for the general situation is that agencies knew or they should have known about a, about a roadway deficiency. Any questions up to this point, Victoria? Yes, we've got a couple. The first one is, can you be sued under both tort and civil rights, say for instance, an injury on a sidewalk? Oh, good question. Can we, someone be, can an agent or individual, I guess, be sued both in a tort claim and in a criminal claim for a sidewalk? case. Oh, that's a good one. I suspect it could happen, but I'm struggling to think of a situation where it might. Uh, you know, Ron, I can look into that and see if I can find any instances and we can report back next time if you'd like. That would be good. Yeah. And actually, I don't want to give it away, but in probably in next Tuesday session or next Thursday session, one of my case studies involves a roadway, it's actually a work zone case, where uh, the defend, one of the defendants was sued with a tort suit, but also was charged criminally. The investigating officer felt that his uh, conduct in terms of advance warning was so bad that he actually filed or the I should say the courts, I guess the district attorney filed criminal charges. So that's that's not, I know that's not a sidewalk example, but it can happen in the roadway case, but it's it's relatively rare, I would say, and probably even rarer in a sidewalk case. Okay, and then the next one, this is a good one. A lot of times state manuals provide references to different NCHRP reports and TRB publications. In that case, do those NCHRP reports and TRB publications become the standard of care? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's probably more of a legal question than an engineering question, but uh, I would say I would say probably not, unless they're actually part of, and I'm trying to think, and maybe somebody can help me, but I'm trying to think of the MUTCD, for example. I'm not sure they really refer to 
say NCHRP reports or documents like that, uh, they may refer to, and I believe they do, to, for example, ANSI standards or ASTM standards, and they refer to PROAG in the ADA arena, but I'm not sure they refer to underlying kind of research-based documents. But that's a good question. You may want to ask the, your count, legal counsel in your agency about that, because that, that is a very good question. But as I say, to me, it's more of a I'm not sure as an engineer I feel comfortable answering that. To me, it seems more of a legal question than engineering question, but that, that is a very good mm -hmm. question. Well, I can put that on the list to do some more research on too. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. That's all we have for right now, okay. other than someone said that this is fantastic. Well, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, and good questions too. Keep the questions coming. I want to spend a few minutes on this slide because this is, is sort of important. These are the elements necessary for a tort action to proceed to trial. And I've worded that very carefully. Notice it doesn't say these are the elements needed for a plaintiff to win their case or to win a big verdict. But if, if we hung out where personal injury attorneys, you know, hang out and where they meet or a pub they go to or something, we'd probably hear them use the phrase, I just want to get in front of a jury. And what they mean is they want to be able to present their case in the courtroom to a jury because they're confident enough that their client is a sympathetic victim and that they're a good enough attorney that they can convince that jury to give a big verdict, you know, give a big award to their client. So these, so that's what a plaintiff wants to do. They want to get their day in court. These are the four things a plaintiff has to prove to get their day in court. And what's significant to us is if a defendant, if the road agency can show that one or more of these is not true, there's a very good chance that a judge would dismiss the case on what's called summary judgment. I mean, the defendant would have to prepare a motion to the, the court to consider, but if a defendant can show that one or more of these is not true, there's a good chance the case would be dismissed. So let's look at these. But having said that now, notice the first one there. The defendant had a duty to the plaintiff. At least those of us in the public sector, we have a duty to the public, as we just talked about, to all roadway users, drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians. So we have a duty to provide reasonably safe facility, reasonably safe roads, sidewalks, crosswalks, so forth. So number one, we can't we in the public sector anyway can't get out of, of that one, that's a given. The plaintiff also has to show that the defendant breached that duty. Breached is, is that's a legal term. I like to think of it as the defendant failed to follow the standard of care. The defendant say, I'm gonna make this up, say they used a green stop sign in this subdivision rather than the red stop sign called for by the MUTCD. That's a breach of the standard of care. And so this part of a case would probably involve engineers or technical people arguing that the plaintiff would probably have an engineering expert who would say this particular section of the manual was violated and it led to the crash. And then the road agency would have maybe an engineer or maybe it's someone on its staff explain the situation from their perspective, that no, we didn't violate it, or if we did, this was the reason why. And so that's would be a kind of a discussion of, and the jury would have to weigh the engineering or the technical issues. The plaintiff also has to prove they suffered damage. And of course, in the work we do, we have what, cars and trucks and buses that weigh thousands or tens of thousands of pounds. They're often moving at high speed. So there's a lot of energy to be dissipated in a crash. And so if they do collide or crash, oftentimes there's serious injury or maybe even fatalities involved. So that's in many road cases, that's not even an issue. But there is a whole category of uh, injuries or cases. I believe the attorneys call them soft tissue cases cases where someone's not, doesn't have any visible injuries. For example, a traumatic brain injury or whiplash injury, you're probably all familiar with those. There may be no apparent 
injury to look at someone, but there may be uh, some uh, neurological or some physical damage associated with it. So in this case, the if it went to court, the uh, argument, if you will, might be between two physicians as opposed to two roadway people. The plaintiff would have a physician who would you know, argue that you know, this this individual was fine before this crash and now they can't do this and they can't do that. But the road agency would also retain the services of what's called an independent medical examiner or evaluator, IME. And they would probably meet with the plaintiff, learn about their medical history, look at their past records, uh, look at their hospital records for the associated with the, the crash that was the basis for the lawsuit. And they might come to the conclusion that I don't think this person's injured, they're faking it. And then it's a matter of you know, who does the, which doctor does the jury believe, is it Dr. A or Dr. B? So that's how that can work. It may not even be you know, hinge sort of on the roadway issues. It may be more the medical doctors opining on different things. But the plaintiff does have to show they suffered damage. There was a case in Pittsburgh a few years ago. I was not involved in it, but I read about it in the newspaper. But a family sued Google for invasion of privacy. And they said, you know, with Google Earth and Google Street View, somebody with a criminal mind could case our property. They could plan a home invasion. They could plan a robbery. They could plan a kidnapping. You know, that's, we need to be compensated for that. And the case worked its way through the legal process that we'll talk about here shortly. And then at some point, I think Google's attorneys filed a motion with the judge that basically said, Your Honor, you have to dismiss this case. Uh, this family cannot prove they suffered any damage or harm. There, there was no evidence of a robbery taking place or someone breaking into their home. Obviously, none of the children were kidnapped. They cannot show that they suffered any sort of damage or harm or injury. And based on the evidence, apparently, that had been produced to date, the judge agreed with that, and the judge dismissed the case. So I use that example to show it is important that the plaintiff does have to show they suffered damage. And if they can't show damage, then the case will probably go away. Number four, the fourth thing the plaintiff has to prove is that that failure to follow the standard of care was a proximate cause of the damage. There's another legal term, proximate cause. I prefer to think about it as sort of the direct cause. Was the failure to follow the standard of care a direct cause of the crash? And this is important. The plaintiff has to show this. If they can't show this, the case may be dismissed. So this is sometimes an area that we can look into in terms of defending these roadway cases. And let me share with you an example. I won't identify any of the participants, but this is a, an actual example of a roadway case where the agency was able to show that number four was not true and a judge dismissed the case. This is in a small rural jurisdiction. Actually, it's here in the east. It's a very small jurisdiction. This, they just have two part-time road supervisors. One of them, I think, was a, an insurance agent, and one of them was a plumber, I believe. And I don't say that with any disrespect. I just say that the point is that neither of these individuals had a real background in construction or roadways or anything like that. But I should mention that one of them, one of these part-time road supervisors, I believe it was the insurance agent, he was a young go-getter guy, and he was really conscientious. He took his position very seriously. And he actually went to a lot of LTAP training, in-person training, and really had gotten some skills and some experience with road maintenance, road construction. And he also had a course on uh, tort liability as well. Well, one night a few years ago, uh, there was a single vehicle crash. A car went off the road, a roadway departure, and went into a tree sideways killing the two young males. They were not related, but two friends. I think they were both in their mid-20s. They were killed in the crash. 
So when he got to his workplace the next morning, uh, this road supervisor heard about the crash. Obviously in this rural community, if there's a double fatality, that's, that's important news. And so he, as I said, he was conscientious. So he said, you know, boy, two young people being killed in a crash, there's a good chance that we could have one or two lawsuits filed against us. So he went to the law enforcement folks who he knew, and he asked if he could get even a early copy of the police report. It hadn't been approved yet by the supervisor or the chief, but he, he looked at the police report because he wanted to know what was going on, what had happened. And this is, this is just the drawing from the police report. And I don't mean to pick on our folks and colleagues in law enforcement, but uh, notice this, not really a detailed drawing. In fact, sometimes I will get calls from attorneys, you know, Ron, can you go out and look at this location? A crash just occurred, but look at it. I'm not sure I'd even know where to go. There's no intersection or utility pole number or anything or house number that would help me find this place. But in talking to the police, this road supervisor knew where it was. But notice here, we have these yaw marks that I showed earlier in that coal truck accident. And then we have the, tr the car sideways into the tree. And I guess the officer was trying to be helpful, but notice he or she just rode here, eight inch edge drop off. And again, this road supervisor had been to enough training that he knew that an eight inch edge drop off on a roadway was not a good thing. That might not even, it's probably not even reasonably safe. But he also knew that, and as I think we saw in the example I gave you earlier, that when a vehicle gets tries to get back on the pavement here, as I mentioned, the vehicle, the tires don't immediately get back on the pavement they kind of scrub or scuff up against this vertical asphalt or concrete surface. Uh, and then when the steering angle is great enough, the vehicle will regain the pavement. So he said, you know, there should be some scuff marks on the insides of the tires of this vehicle. So he got permission from the police department to go to the impound yard and actually inspect the vehicle that was in the crash. But on his way to the impound yard, he stopped off at the site. So he actually went to the site, and this is what he found. It's about an eight inch edge drop off. Would we agree that that's not a reasonably safe road condition? But when he was at the site, what he found was that drop off was here, toward the right side of this image. And he said, you know, this vehicle, probably never even encountered that drop off. And in this area, the drop off was, you know, probably an inch or less. It was, the shoulder was pretty much flush with the pavement. The drop off was over here. So then he continued to the impound yard and checked the vehicle. And I think this is probably a left tire rather than a right tire, but he looked at all the tires. They all looked the same here. And notice you can see some mud and some grass and weeds and things. But of course, this vehicle went off the road and hit a tree. But note, they all, all four tires looked like this. And notice, there's really no scrub mark or scuff mark on the inside of that tire or any of the tires. So he filed his photographs. He wrote a few notes, had some measurements from his site inspection. And when he got back to his workplace, he just filed that away. But sure enough, about a year later, there were two lawsuits filed against this local road agency. And the, 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 it was, the two lawsuits sort of worked their way through the discovery process. And then uh, maybe a year and a half, two years after the lawsuit was filed, the attorney for the road agency prepared what's called a motion for summary judgment. Basically means a motion to the court to dismiss the case. And you can see his argument there. He said, there was an edge drop off on this roadway. And that is a breach of the standard of care. We shouldn't have an eight inch edge drop off on our roadways, but it was not a contributing factor in this case because this vehicle never reached that edge of pavement drop off. And so this is the that number four on that list I had, the breach of the duty 
has to be a proximate cause or direct cause of the crash. And his argument was, and he supported his brief or motion that he wrote with the photographs and the measurements and the data and the notes that this uh, road supervisor had compiled. And the judge apparently felt the evidence was so, you know, so strong that the judge actually dismissed the case. So there's a, an example of an agency by doing a little bit of extra work right after the crash and having good, good information in their file, they were able to successfully defend the case. And I'm not saying we should investigate every crash like that, but certain crashes like this one, which was a double fatality, and the road supervisor recognized that the, the legal exposure there was pretty high. And so he felt it was worth his effort to do that little bit of extra investigation work. So just something to think about. Negligence, another legal term. We've all probably heard that term. It's the most common theory of tort against road agencies. But here is my definition of negligence. It's the failure to use the standard of care expected of a reasonable and prudent person in a particular set of circumstances. Notice there's that term reasonable again. But also notice the way I worded that. Sometimes I think people think negligence is just a failure to do something. Negligence could be doing something a reasonable person would not do. So that's why I phrased it the way I did there with it's a failure to use the standard of care expected of a reasonable and prudent person. It's not only failing to do something, it could be doing something a reasonable person would not do. Every state has a Tort Claims Act. These are bills or acts passed by the state legislatures. Uh, and because of that, they do get changed over time. So that's something to keep in mind. They're not usually static. They do change over time as new, maybe a new governor comes in or a new legislature comes in. And uh, so they may change the Tort Claims Act. But why they're significant is because they define the types and natures of nature of claims and suits that can be brought against state and local road agencies, or also against private entities. But here our focus is the state and local agencies. So let's generally look at some of the things that might be in a Tort Claims Act. I know because we have so many states represented here, we can't really get into each state, but just look at some of the sorts of things that might be involved. And one of those is what's called immunities. Everybody's probably heard the term immunities. I mean, it's been in the news lately with COVID, right? Whether or not people develop immunity to, to the virus. But here we're talking about immunities from the, the legal standpoint. And immunity basically means an entity can't be sued for a particular situation. And you might recall, or maybe some of you have heard the term sovereign immunity, which comes to us from British law. Sovereign, of course, refers to the king or queen, basically meant you could not sue the king or queen. A modern day translation of that would be you can't sue the government. Maybe some of you have heard that. Actually, that's not true anymore, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this class if you couldn't sue the government. I think it was in 1953 or thereabouts, the federal government lost its sovereign immunity. And then after that time, state and local governments also lost their sovereign immunity. So obviously now it is possible to sue, to sue governmental entities, but different states have different immunities. And then the, the flip side of that would be what's called an exception to immunity. That means an agency can be sued for a particular matter. And that's really what should concern us is the exceptions to immunities, because these are the areas where we have the risk exposure of a tort claim. And just briefly, here, here's an example. I'm not sure, it almost looks like a Western state to me as opposed to an Eastern state. It looks more like soil rather than, than rock, but imagine this is say a rock uh, slope or cut slope. And notice there is a, falling rock symbolic warning sign here. 
but let's imagine this is a rock slope and has the falling rock sign. And let's imagine this is a case from Western Virginia a few years ago. This is not this, this photo of the scene, but uh, a in Western Virginia, in the mountains, there's a big rock cut through through one of the ridges. And one day, a truck driver was operating his semi through, on the roadway. And if you can picture a boulder, good-sized boulder, fell off the slope and kind of bounced down the side slope and bounced on toward the roadway and actually went through the roof of his cab. He sustained a serious injury. Luckily, he survived, but he sustained a serious injury because this rock came through the roof of his cab. And so he filed a lawsuit against the Virginia DOT. And the allegation was negligent maintenance of the roadside, of that slope. Well, Virginia has a Tort Claims Act, like every state does, and in Virginia's Tort Claim Act, design is immune. The Virginia DOT cannot be sued over an alleged design deficiency. So the attorney in Virginia, who I happen to know, in the Attorney General's office, who defended VDOT, when he got this case, to, just to show you some of the strategy and tactics that they use, his take on this was, I'm going to try to have this case dismissed because this is a design case. This is not a maintenance case. So he prepared a motion to the judge that basically said, Your Honor, this is not a maintenance case. This is a design case. We as a DOT, we could have designed this slope much flatter. So it's a, no, no rocks would fall off a flat slope like that. But of course, we would have had to acquire a lot of additional right of way. We would have had to move hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of earth and rock. And that was too expensive and too disruptive to the community. So we just decided to leave the slope like this. But because this is a design issue, you should dismiss the case. Well, the judge didn't buy that. The judge didn't dismiss the case. And so the case proceeded. And then Peter's, Peter's the name of the attorney who was involved. He argued, well, your honor, our duty if we can't provide a reasonably safe road, we have a duty to warn, and we had a warning sign. And actually, I should note, maybe some of you are familiar, but uh, in Virginia, the falling rock warning sign actually says fall in rock, F-A-L-L-E-N, as opposed to falling rock, which I believe it says in my state and maybe some other states. So the plaintiff argued, in counter argument, that's the wrong sign. My client wasn't issued, wasn't injured by a fall in rock. It was a falling rock that came through the roof of his cab. And so I just, I know this can get kind of convoluted, but I just wanted to share with you some of the strategies and tactics that the attorneys might use to, to get a case dismissed or also to, to prevent a case from being Dismissed. So here we have design versus maintenance and also versus different types of, of warnings. So what you need to know is just probably become familiar generally with the Tort Claims Act in your state. And probably the best way to do that might be to talk with your agency legal account, legal counsel, attorney, or legal division, whatever you might call it, to just to get a flavor for what the Tort Claims Act calls for in your state. Uh, and the reason I say that's easy is you can actually read the Tort Claims Act, but it's of course written in the legalese of you know legislative acts. And so it's not always the easiest read, at least for you know for a layperson like me to uh, to read the actual Tort Claims Act. It's probably better to talk to your agency counsel and recognize, as I mentioned, that the Tort Claims Acts do change over time. And many, many of you have probably heard the term tort reform, which was a popular term, what, maybe eight or 10 years ago. And tort reform, a key part of that was to get states to reform their Tort Claims Act or revise their Tort Claims Acts. 
defenses to liability. These would be part of the Tort Claims Act as well. There's two main defenses. One is what's called contributory negligence. The other is comparative negligence. And comparative negligence is most common across the country. So let's look at that first. Comparative negligence says a party can collect weighted damages for comparative negligence. So if the plaintiff is found by the jury to be between one and 50% negligent, they collect weighted damages. So as an example, I'll use myself as an example. I wouldn't sue a road agency, but imagine that I did. And the case goes to trial and the, the jury says, Ron, you were seriously injured in this crash. There was some negligence on the part of the road agency. We're gonna award you a million dollars. But Ron, the evidence is pretty clear that as you were approaching this curve, you were texting somebody on your phone. So we feel you're 30% negligent. So I don't get my million dollars. My million dollars is reduced by my negligence. So I would get a million dollars minus 30% of a million, or I'd get $700,000 rather than a million dollars because I was negligent. I had comparative negligence. So that's how that works. If the plaintiff is found to be greater than 50% negligent, say 51% negligent, they do not collect at all. So you'll hear defense attorneys talk about they want to show that the plaintiff was 51% negligent or more negligent because then they do not collect. The other defense is contributory negligence, and this is much, much stricter. Notice contributory negligence says a party cannot collect damages if their negligence, even if as little as 1% contributed to the crash. Now think about that. I'd like to think of myself as a safe driver. Probably we all do, but I bet if I was in a crash, somebody could probably pin 1% negligence on me for, I don't know, not having my headlights aimed in a few years or my windshield was scratched or something like that. So this is pretty strict. If, if the defendant can show that a plaintiff is 1% negligent, they, they can't collect any damages. But this uh, defense applies only in four states, mainly in the southeastern United States, Alabama, Maryland, North Carolina, and Virginia. But let, if you allow me to back up to this slide a minute, you know, think, remember the, our Joe and Sally case, that icebreaker exercise that we started off the session with? What the defendants would try to do is show that Sally was probably try to pin her with more than 50% negligence by getting into a vehicle with a person who, you know, most likely was impaired. So that's sort of how that works. They try to show that Sally was negligent, comparatively negligent by getting into the vehicle. One more legal term. I actually made two more legal terms. One, but one is subsequent remedial measure. One of the more lengthy terms we've looked at today. Subsequent remedial measure. I don't know if anybody's heard that term. If you're not an attorney, there's probably no reason you would have heard that term. But uh, what that means is, as it says here, when measures are taken that would have made the injury or the harm less likely to occur, the evidence of remedial measures is not admissible to prove negligence or a defect in design or the need for a warning. And maybe some of you have encountered this situation, but I hear this from time to time from people. They'll say, you know, I went out to the crash site and man, after the crash, I saw that that stop sign was more 80% obscured by brush and vines growing over it. I can see how that driver would have blown the stop sign. They couldn't see it. But I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to trim that brush or remove those vines because that's an admission that there was a problem. Well, let me tell you, that's bad thinking. And the reason why it's bad thinking is because of this idea of subsequent remedial measures. 
This concept says that if we remove that brush and those vines from in front of the stop sign, the fact that we removed it after the crash cannot be used as evidence or is not admissible as evidence to prove negligence or say negligence and maintenance, that sort of thing. Because the idea is we want agencies to make our facilities safe. So if, if that ever happens to you, if you ever get out to a crash site or something after the crash has occurred and you see some problem, you think, oh, wow, I you know, wish we'd taken care of that. You should take care of it you know, as soon as you can, because the fact that you corrected it cannot be used as evidence to prove negligence or, or defect in design. And one other thing I forgot to mention early on uh, that I should have, and that is, the, you've all probably heard the term burden of proof. That, I guess there have been some books or films by that same name probably. But burden of proof means what, what does the plaintiff or the prosecution in a criminal case have to, to prove to make their case? And of course, in a criminal case, as most of you are probably aware, the burden of proof is that the prosecution has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you can imagine the scales of justice, beyond a re reasonable doubt means that the evidence that the prosecution has to present in terms of physical evidence or witnesses, witness testimony or whatever, that evidence really has to make those one side of those scales of justice really move down. And I've heard people say to me when I do in-person training, they'll say, well, the plaintiff can never prove their case against the road agency beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's why I wanted to bring this topic up because in a tort case, the burden of proof is not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's by the preponderance of the evidence, meaning it's more likely than not that the road agency you know, failed to maintain the road or whatever it might be. Or if those scales of justice, again, look at those scales of justice again, they just have to tip down a little bit in favor of the plaintiff. So I wanted to make sure everybody is clear on that. The burden of proof in a roadway case for the plaintiff is they don't have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They just have to prove it by the preponderance of the evidence. So really that it's more likely than not that the road agency was negligent for example. But with that, I think we're, I think our timing's good. We're just about out of time. And so we'll open it up to questions, or I don't know if any other questions have come in, Victoria. Yes, they have, Ron. I'm going to start off with the first one here, but we might have to defer your answer on a few of these till the next session. Okay. So the first one, in case of sight distance measurement, the height of a driver eye is measured at three and a half feet. Let's say the vehicle involved in the crash is a full-size SUV with driver eye height at four and a half feet, in which case the sight distance would not have been obscured. Would the lack of three and a half feet sight distance clearance be considered a proximate cause of damage? Uh, I would say it could be, yeah. But I would say that would be a case, that case, a case like that would probably proceed to trial because a judge would say there's questions of fact here that a jury should decide because you're right, the standard would call for an eye height of three and a half feet. But if the driver was actually at four and a half feet and had a clear line of sight, that's something that, say I was with the road agency trying to defend the case, that's certainly something I would want to bring up as part of my, my defense of the case. Okay, one more question. MUTCD says fallen rocks, not falling. Is a symbol sign better than a word sign? I've heard that word signs are less ambiguous, but seems like the opposite in this case. Yeah, that's I've struggled with that over the years too as a traffic person. And I guess given my age and doing this for 40 years, it's been interesting to me how years ago you would read studies that symbol signs were much preferable to word signs and then maybe 15 years later there'd be a study that would have just the opposite uh, findings that that word signs were preferable to symbol 
science. I, yeah, this is one of those gray areas that 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 at least I struggle with, and I'm I think it almost depends on the particular situation. But I forget how that was was worded. But I would agree with that comment that to me the whether it's falling or fallen, to me the word sign would probably be better than or more meaningful than the uh, than the symbolic sign. But then you get into you know language issues. Can everybody read the the words on the sign and that sort of thing? So it, it's it's a tough. That's a good question because it's, it's a tough topic for traffic engineers. And I will be providing all the questions from today over to Ron after we wrap up. And we're right at 3.30, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Ron, thank you for the great session today. It felt like I was back in torts class in law school. <laughs> no, thank you all. And thanks for the good questions. Keep them coming next time. Great. We'll see everybody on Thursday. Take care.